Hello everybody, welcome to chapter 18 lecture, gastrointestinal and urologic emergencies. In this lecture, of course, we're going to be talking about some of the pathophysiology that relates to the GI system or the digestive system as well as the urinary system. And uh, we're going to be going through an overview of some of the anatomy and physiology as well. So as always, we're going to skip the first couple slides, which are the introduction, and we're going to get straight into it. Okay, so <clears throat> the abdominal cavity contains the gastrointestinal system, commonly abbreviated the GI system. So whenever you see uh, commonly in medical literature or publications or just talking between providers, you'll hear GI, GU, and that is in reference to GI, the gastrointestinal system, and GU, the genital urinary system. So gastrointestinal means uh, the... Uh, organs and systems and tissues relating to uh, the gastrointestinal tract, the digestive system, and uh, the genital urinary system is in reference, of course, to the genitalia and the urinary system, because in both males and females, the genitalia and uh, the genital system, excuse me, and the urinary system are very closely related to each other or function uh, with some dependence on the other. They are made up of both solid and hollow organs. This is key to remember uh, when we're dealing with the abdominal system because eventually we're going to get to trauma and how it relates to the abdominal organs. Uh, and we need to understand, just like we talked about in Chapter 6, the differences between solid and hollow organs. Not only what they do or what their function is, but also understanding what their function is is going to give us some, give us some insight into how severe uh, these uh, injuries could be to solid and hollow organs when the abdomen is involved with trauma. Uh, so just as a reminder, solid organs, they are extremely vascular, vascular, which means they have a lot of blood flow going through them. And uh, solid organs, when they are injured or pierced or ruptured or lacerated, whatever the word may be, the trauma may be, uh, they will bleed very heavily, leading to internal bleeding, which of course will uh, cause you to enter into hypovolemic shock very quickly. Whereas hollow organs, uh, they are hollow, of course, tubes uh, whose main purpose is to transport different types of toxic digestive wastes through uh, the digestive system. And these hollow organs are vascular a little bit, so they don't bleed very much, but when they're ruptured, of course, they're going to leak that toxic waste product into the very sterile environment of the inside of the abdomen, which will not kill you immediately, but can culminate in a very, very serious infection, uh, which can lead to sepsis and which can kill you. So it's important to keep that in mind when we get to the chapters later on. So the solid organs of the abdomen include the liver, which is in the right upper quadrants, the largest uh, organ in the entire abdominal quadrants. Uh, it's its anterior towards the front of the body. The spleen, which sits uh, posterior to the stomach in the left upper quadrant. Uh, we have the pancreas, which sits more medial, I like to classify it, in the right upper quadrant, uh, really flush with the bottom of the liver. Uh, the kidneys, which sit in the retroperitoneal space, uh, which means towards the back of the ab abdominal cavity, more uh, towards the spine. Uh, and the ovaries in females, which are in the right and left lower abdominal quadrants. Remember that injury to a solid organ, like we talked about on the last slide, it can cause shock due to internal bleeding. And of course, we would classify that as hypovolemic shock. Where well, the hollow organs of the abdominal cavity uh, would include the gallbladder, which is in the right upper quadrant just behind the liver. Uh, we have the stomach in the left upper quadrant. The small intestine, which is uh, the four corners intestine really concentrated to a tight bundle uh, towards the middle of the abdomen. And then we have the large intestine, uh, which um, also is more or less a four corners, I like to say. Uh, intestine because it does pass through all of the abdominal quadrants. 
uh, also referred to as the colon. And we have the urinary bladder, which in males and females sits right in the middle of the right and left lower abdominal quadrants. Uh, and remember that breach or injury of a hollow organ causes it to leak its contents, those toxic waste uh, products, and contaminate the abdominal cavity. So remember we just talked about a couple slides ago, uh, hollow organ rupture will leak these toxic waste chemicals or toxic waste products into the abdominal cavity, which is a very sterile environment. So it won't kill you as fast as bleeding, but it can lead to very serious infections that could, over time, maybe... Uh, over a span of days or weeks. And here you see on a female uh, the solid organs as opposed to the hollow organs. Uh, so you can take a second in your book and, and uh, uh, look at these different uh, abdominal organs and where they sit and try to picture in your head when they're all together uh, how many um, how many organs, whether they be solid or hollow, uh, just the sheer amount of tissue and nerves and blood vessels uh, are attributed to the abdomen. And also remember when we're dealing with trauma uh, to the abdominal cavity, the abdominal cavity is relatively unprotected. Really all that you have is your skin, including the subcutaneous layer, the fat layer, uh, and uh, the abdominal muscles. Other than that, maybe in the right and left upper quadrant, you have a little bit of the rib cage that helps out with that. And then in the lower abdominal quadrants towards the sides, of course, you have the iliac crest of the pelvis that might help with a little bit of protection. But really between those two sites, all you have is skin and muscle that's protecting uh, some of these large, very vascular solid organs uh, from trauma. And um, it's important to remember that the abdomen given any type of force, blunt or penetrating, really doesn't have that much pr protection. So the potential for serious injury increases very greatly when you're dealing with the abdomen. So we're going to talk about the gastrointestinal system is responsible for the digestive process. Remember, digestion begins when food is chewed. Uh, so digestion really begins with saliva in the, uh, in the mouth when you're chewing. And saliva really does two things. Uh, saliva contains certain enzymes that help break down the food before it even reaches your stomach. And also saliva is important because it coats that mass of food that you're chewing into a wad, for lack of a better word. Uh, it coats it in a slippery substance, the saliva, uh, that really aids in the transportation when you swallow of that food down through the esophagus into the stomach. And the example I always use is, Imagine having no saliva, chewing up a bunch of tortilla chips, and then swallowing them. It would be pretty painful, and uh, it wouldn't want to go down very well. So saliva helps a lot in that sense. Uh, remember that the stomach is the main digestive organ. It's also very important to remember that the stomach plays absolutely no role in the absorption of nutrients and medications and uh, glucose, some of the main things that we want to get out of the food that we eat. Uh, remember that the stomach contains hydrochloric acid, and the stomach's main job, its only job, is to use that hydrochloric acid to break down the food that you eat from a solid product into a liquid product. And the purpose of that is uh, we want to send that liquid product uh, over to the small intestine, and uh, the bulk of the work there is done by the small intestine, but the small intestine only accepts that liquid product from the stomach, and that's why the stomach is so important. The liver assists in digestion. It secretes bile and acids in uh, the digestion of fats. It helps filter out toxic substances from the bloodstream and helps to create glucose stores. We're gonna talk about this in the next lecture. Uh, which is endocrine emergencies and how um, some of these different uh, hormones and these glucose stores that the liver creates are vitally important to the way that our body maintains its energy stores. Uh, the gallbladder is a reservoir for some of the bile that's created by the liver. Remember the gallbladder and the appendix we'll talk about are vestigial organs, which means uh, the most basic definition is uh, they're organs that you can live just fine without. 
If you were to take out your liver, you would have a very difficult time surviving. Taking out the spleen or the kidneys, uh, you would have to undergo some very serious, very thorough medical treatment uh, to be able to survive. But when you take out the gallbladder and or the appendix, uh, the body will readjust fairly easily and be able to survive just fine without them. So a lot of people have gallbladder issues, like we'll talk about cholecystitis. Some people have gallbladder cancer. Um, they have flare-ups or inflammation of the gallbladder, which is very painful and can lead to uh, inflammation to such a degree that it actually ruptures, which of course we know solid or, or uh, excuse me, hollow organs when they rupture. Uh, disperse those toxic waste products into the abdomen, which can cause very serious complications. So some people have their gall their gallbladders removed uh, when they have start having issues with their gallbladder. Some people get their gallbladder rem removed prophylactically. Maybe they have a history of gallbladder cancer. But anyway, like I said, the gallbladder and the appendix, your body can live just fine without them. So now we get to one of the most important organs in the digestive system, the small intestine. Now, the small intestine is broken into three distinct uh, section, sections, and all these different sections play a different role in the way that the small intestine does its job, uh, and they're all very important. So the three, uh, the three sections of the small intestine are the duodenum, the jejunum, and on the next slide, it'll mention the ileum. Uh, so, I always used to remember that as an EMT student as uh, Dow Jones Industrial, DJI, Duodenum, Jejunum, and Ilium. Uh, I'm less concerned of your ability to know what each three of these does specifically. It is important, uh, but uh, at the same time, I really want you to focus on what the small intestine's overall job is and why it's so important. So. The small intestine, with the help of the different sections, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum, uh, is to take that liquid product from the stomach, like we just talked about, and absorb all of the medications, the nutrients, the main one being glucose, uh, and any other vitamins or minerals that the body needs to survive from the food that we eat. So the small intestine, or the uh, stomach, remember, does not play any role in absorption. All it does is break that solid product into a liquid product. Uh, and the small intestine does the bulk of the work where it absorbs what we need. Uh, that's why we say when we're talking about rates of absorption for different, uh, different routes of administration for medications, IV is the fastest because the goal of medication administration is, is to get it into the bloodstream before it takes any effect. And uh, so if you give or administer that medication straight into the bloodstream intravenously, it's going to have an immediate effect on the body. Whereas the slowest rate of absorption is through the digestive system, PO, through the mouth. Because, like we said, the, the stomach doesn't do anything to absorb that product. It has to take however long uh, to move through the stomach into the small intestine and the small intestine is responsible for absorbing those medications and putting them into the bloodstream. And now the drug is going to start to take effect. So the duodenum, uh, digestive juices from the pancreas and the liver mix in the duodenum. The, pan the pancreas at this point will release amylase, bicarbonate, and insulin. Uh, we're going to talk about bar bicarbonate and insulin in the next lecture. Very important. Uh, the jejunum, the next section, absorbs digestive products and does most of the work. So specifically, the job of the small intestine is to absorb products, and it happens, most of it, in uh, the jejunum, specifically. The last section, uh, the ileum, which connects to the large intestine, uh, its job is to absorb nutrients uh, that were not absorbed earlier. And it helps to absorb bile acids so they can be returned to the liver for future use. And vitamin B12 for making nerve cells and red blood cells. Now we get to the colon, the large intestine, who also has a very important job. Um, food that is not broken down comes here. So basically, 
uh, once that solid product is made into a liquid in the stomach, the liquid product is passed on to the small intestine where it goes through the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum for the purposes of absorption of the things that we absolutely need and then gets passed on to the colon. So whatever liquid waste product moves from the small intestine into the large intestine is basically everything that you eat that the body has no use for at the time. Uh, so uh, it's important to remember that this is still a liquid waste product as it moves into the large intestine. And that's one of the main functions of the large intestine we'll get to in a second. Remember that the all of the digestive system uh, has a wave-like contraction through the smooth muscle that you cannot control called peristalsis. And peristalsis is incredibly important uh, for the continual movement of waste products through your intestines until it reaches the output, which is the rectum. Uh, so we will talk about a condition in which peristalsis actually fails or it stops and it can lead to very serious complications. So peristalsis, we don't really um, think about that often. Of course, we can't control it, so we don't think about it. Uh, but it is vitally important to the function of the digestive system. Uh, here, also in the large intestine, water is reabsorbed. So that liquid product that's passed from the small intestine to the large intestine, uh, <coughs> everything that you don't need anymore, uh, anything that your body doesn't need at the time, excuse me, uh, water is going to be reabsorbed out of that digestive product and form solid compact waste product, which is stool or feces. Uh, and that water that's reabsorbed is going to get kicked over to the kidneys and uh, through, a very through a very complex chain of reactions, the kidneys are going to determine whether or not to hold on to that water uh, and keep it in the bloodstream. Uh, in terms of helping with blood pressure and circulation, or if it's going to excrete uh, some of that liquid or that reabsorbed water uh, through the kidney or through the urinary system. The spleen, like we talked about, it's located in the abdomen in the left upper quadrant, just behind the stomach. It is in the abdomen, but it has no digestive function. It's actually a part of the lymphatic system. So, it assists in filtering blood. Uh, one of its, uh, I always teach that there's, there are plenty of functions for these uh, abdominal organs, uh, but the two most important ones for the spleen that I want you to know are that it assists in filtering red blood, or red blood cells. So it helps to clear out any dead or damaged or dying red blood cells out of the system. Uh, it also helps to develop red blood cells, and the other main function is it holds on to a large amount of red blood cells. Uh, so it acts as a red blood cell reservoir. If your body's in a time of crisis, maybe you're compensating for shock or uh, you are low on red blood cell count, uh, the body, the brain, will go to the spleen for that extra reservoir of red blood cells uh, to aid uh, in the compensation or whatever it is that the body needs those red blood cells for. And it also helps produce antibodies to help fight infection. So now we get to the genitalia. In the male reproductive system, we have the testicles where um, uh, sexual hormones, male-dependent sexual hormones are produced, uh, mainly testosterone. And uh, the epididymis, which sits right on top of the testicles, uh, which helps uh, aid in the creation of sex cells or gametes. Uh, for males, it's sperm. Uh, we have the vasa differentia, which are the tubes that connect uh, the testicles and the epididymis to the urethra. And the vasa differentia are very important for, uh, in terms of procreation, in terms of uh, uh, very important for ejaculation. Uh, the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and of course, the penis. Then we get to the female reproductive system, the ovaries, which are uh, very comparable to the male system uh, in terms of the testes. Uh, the ovaries are responsible for producing um, female-specific sex hormones like estrogen, as well as uh, producing eggs. Uh, which will eventually, in terms of procreation, move through the fallopian tubes, which connect the ovaries 
to the uterus. Uh, the um, ovaries will release eggs in alternating months that will go into or travel through the fallopian tubes. Uh, and in the fallopian tubes for procreation, the egg should meet up with a sperm cell and uh, that will now become a fertilized egg, which we refer to as a zygote, which is a baby. And that zygote will move through the fallopian tubes and implant itself into the uterus. The uterus is, uh, lies dormant in every female, right in the middle of the lower two abdominal quadrants. It's made of smooth muscle, so you can't control it. And uh, if a fertilized egg it plants itself, implants itself, excuse me, into the uterus, then it will grow over the course of nine months into a child, and the uterus will grow and strengthen uh, alongside the child. And uh, the uterus really won't come into play in terms of birthing a child until the very end stage when contractions start. And those muscular contractions to help push the baby through the birth canal are the product of uh, the uterus doing its job. Uh, the cervix is the gateway between the vaginal opening or the birth canal and the uterus. Uh, so it's called the lower third of the uterus or the neck of the uterus. Uh, you'll see it described a couple different ways in different uh, medical texts. Uh, but the cervix is responsible for separating the vaginal canal from the uterus. And of course, the outermost portion of the female reproductive system is the vagina. So the urinary system in both males and females controls the discharge of waste materials filtered from the blood by the kidneys. There are two kidneys, one on each side of the body. They are in the retroperitoneal space. So it's important for you to understand, and I would make sure that you know this, uh, that the kidneys are in the retroperitoneal space or the flank space. So anytime really you see the book or you see uh, registry exam questions referring to uh, retroperitoneal or flank, F-L-A-N-K, uh, they're almost always talking about that same area and they're almost always referencing the kidneys. So we have something called Gray Turner sign and Gray Turner sign is bruising indicative of internal bleeding over the flank. So that means most likely uh, that that internal bleeding is coming from damage to the kidneys. And you would know that because the registry of course says, would say retroperitoneal space or the flank area. So they help regulate acidity and blood pressure. They help rid the body of toxic wastes. Uh, and the kidneys are solid organs. Uh, so they have a lot of blood flow uh, through the kidneys. And what happens is blood flow goes into the kidneys, uh, into Bowman's eye uh, is what it's called. And it's a really, really tight bundle of very small arteries. And that pressure in those arteries in the kidneys is so high that it actually helps to manipulate osmotic pressures and force uh, fluid out of the vasculature into the kidneys. And that's where that fluid uh, that waste product uh, will eventually move from the kidneys into the bladder so that we can excrete that waste as urine. The ureters join each kidney to the bladder. Uh, so each kidney is connected to the bladder by these tubes called ureters. Uh, very important to understand that ureters are different than the urethra. Uh, but this is both the same, uh, the same, excuse me, in both males and females. The bladder itself is located behind the pubic symphysis, uh, that very, very uh, tight, very dense piece of cartilage that holds the right and left half uh, of the pelvis together anteriorly towards the front of the body. The bladder empties urine outside of the body through the urethra, which usually outputs 1.5 to 2 liters of urine per day. So here you see the male urinary system, and you can see the kidneys. And you can see that they're connected on each side by these tubes here, which are ureters. They both drain into the bladder here okay and that bladder which is uh, smooth muscle uh, will uh, hold on to that urine waste product 
uh, until you get that voiding sense when the bladder tells the brain that um, it's full you get that voiding sense consciously where you know that you need to go to the bathroom in males that fluid will then travel through the prostate gland that you can see and through this long tube that runs the entire length of the shaft of the penis which is called the urethra and the urethra carries that liquid waste product all the way through the shaft of the penis so that you can urinate uh, also this is what I was talking about the urethra is connected to the testes by the vasa differentia and the vasa differentia trans uh, transport excuse me uh, the sperm cells up to the urethra and of course it is exited from the male body for the purposes of ejaculation pathophysiology the abdominal cavity is lined by the peritoneum and it's important for you to know the difference between uh, these two definitions here visceral and parietal okay so the peritoneum is just the the lining that's inside of the abdominal cavity remember we talked about earlier that any uh, tissue that lines an actual organ itself is the visceral lining and any uh, tissue that lines the actual cavity that the organ sits in is referred to as parietal so uh, the visceral peritoneum is uh, that tissue that lines the the actual um, abdominal organs that sit in the abdominal cavity and the parietal peritoneum is the uh, tissue that lines the actual uh, cavity that all the organs sit in so the example I use to explain this most often to my students is <clears throat> if you yourself your entire body was an organ the clothes on your back would be the visceral lining of your body and the paint of the walls uh, of the room that you're sitting in right now uh, would be the uh, parietal lining okay so the difference between the covering of the actual organ and the covering of the cavity that the organ sits in okay very important for you to know the difference between visceral and parietal so foreign materials such as blood pus or bile can irritate the peritoneum which can cause peritonitis so remember we talked about itis always means inflammation subsequent to infection uh, so anytime you see itis it means that there is an infection somewhere and uh, the prefix whatever word comes before itis in a medical in medical terminology uh, means exactly what tissue or what organ is um, infected so in this case peritonitis means inflammation subsequent to infection of the peritoneum so either the visceral peritoneum is infected which lines the actual organ or the abdominal uh, cavity lining which is the parietal peritoneum could be infected so anytime you see itis means there's inflammation because there is some sort of infection in this case it happens to be uh, the inflammation and infection of the peritoneum you should know that acute abdomen is what we use to refer to the sudden onset of abdominal pain often associated with severe progressive problems so remember that acute in nature is referring to very short onset onset really out of nowhere um, so acute abdomen this idea that um, abdominal pain is occurring really they haven't struggled with it in the past they usually don't have a history of abdominal pain uh, it, that is really what acute is referencing the out of nowhere spontaneous onset uh, or maybe new onset of abdominal pain uh, and it should never be taken lightly uh, remember that some of the hardest calls that will ever run in the field are calls that are relating to um, abdominal pain uh, especially acute abdomen because it could be something very severe it could be uh, internal bleeding it could be the rupture of uh, a hollow organ that spills its contents and now we're starting to deal with the beginnings of 
uh, what could be a serious infection. Um, but understand that difference between acute abdomen, which is sudden onset, and uh, chronic abdominal pain, which is something that they deal with progressively over time, long term. So peritonitis we already talked about. Itis means inflammation subsequent to infection of the peritoneum. So this is inflammation of the peritoneum, which can cause a condition called ileus. Uh, ileus is the paralysis of muscular contractions through the abdominal cavity. So um, I had one patient that had uh, ileus. Now, sometimes ileus can be um, caused by a very severe infection. Other times ileus can be referred to as or uh, ileus can be caused by uh, what we call bowel impactment, and that means that um, fecal matter is not moving through the large intestine the way that it should, and so it starts to pack up or condense inside of uh, the large intestine. And of course, these are waste products for a reason. The body doesn't want them. We need to get rid of them. And uh, if they aren't moving efficiently through the large intestine, they can start to get caught up in the large intestine and they can start to build up. So this lady, um, one of the causes of that is chronic opiate abuse. And I had a patient that she was older towards her 80, toward, uh, toward um, the 80s. And uh, she, when we got there, had very severe abdominal pain. She had been struggling with it for a while. And uh, she told us that she had not had a bowel movement in 14 days, in two weeks. And uh, so all that time, she's not having a bowel movement. All of that fecal matter is just packing up um, or it's just becoming sedentary in the large intestine. And it just keeps building up and building up and building up. And uh, her abdomen was cold to the touch. It was hard as a rock. Um, and she was in very severe pain. And ileus, in and of itself, uh, this lady had ileus, um, but ileus means, uh, just like we talked about, that peristalsis, that wave-like contraction that moves fecal matter through your digestive system, uh, stopped. It's not working anymore. So there's no wave-like contraction or wave-like motion uh, through the abdominal system, and there was no movement of waste products through her gastrointestinal tract. And eventually what happened is a rare condition uh, called fecal emesis. Emesis means to vomit and fecal means fecal matter. So this lady, the large intestine had got so backed up uh, with, um, with uh, fecal matter that eventually the body needs to get rid of that uh, waste product and that waste product will eventually take the path of least resistance and in this case uh, that she actually ended up vomiting her fecal matter, um, which is a very, very severe, really far down the road um, complication of ileus. But understand that ileus can lead to that because of this main point right here, the paralysis of that muscular contraction, which is called peristalsis. Diverticulitis. Itis means inflammation subsequent to, an inf to, to infection of diverticuli. Uh, diverticuli specifically are um, little tiny um, pieces of something, material. Sometimes it could be popcorn kernels. Um, I actually read a study where uh, diverticuli can actually be formed with um, the little tiny shavings that come off of uh, toothpicks. When you leave them in your mouth too long, you can end up swallowing them. And whatever this substance is gets caught in the walls of the large intestine. And as fecal matter continues to move through the large intestine, that little, that substance can actually uh, scrape off some of that fecal matter and keep it in the large intestine. So it doesn't actually move out and you don't actually excrete that portion of fecal matter. And eventually we'll create this uh, pocket of waste inside of the uh, the large intestine and it will begin to grow and fester and eventually become infected. So the diverticuli are those pockets that form uh, inside of the uh, large intestine and eventually will become infected and inflamed and that's where we get the term diverticulitis. 
Now, people with diverticulitis have a lot of abdominal pain. Um, it can more or less come out of nowhere, but until that infection is remedied, they will continue to have abdominal pain. And so uh, diverticul diverticulitis is so common, especially in the middle age range or the geriatric age range. Uh, it's so common that if you come in with acute abdomen or severe abdominal pain or um, changes in the color consistency or the smell of your bowel movements, uh, one of the first things that they're going to look for with a CT or an ultrasound in the ER is if you have diverticulitis, diverticulitis these infected pockets in the wall of your colon. Uh, so sometimes the damage is so bad from the infection that they'll have to do what's called a bowel resection, where they go in and they will surgically remove that portion of your bowels. Uh, and you can uh, live with that removal of, of a um, bowel. I've heard of people that get removal of upwards of four feet of intestine from their digestive tract, and they're going to have to have a new uh, diet. They're going to have to really closely watch what their diet is um, and keep an eye on the abdominal pain or the uh, color consistency or smell of their bowel movements. But uh, the treatment for diverticulitis, if you catch it fast enough, uh, has a pretty good prognosis for most patients that have it. Cholecystitis, itis means inflammation subsequent to an infection. Uh, of the gallbladder. So what can happen in the gallbladder is you can get these gallstones, uh, which are very comparable to kidney stones. Uh, they get caught in the common duct of the gallbladder, which don't allow the exit of those digestive waste products, uh, the, that bile that's produced from the liver. And eventually, like I said, those waste products were meant to get rid of them. So if we hold on to them for a extended period of time, it can cause a very severe infection. So infection of the gallbladder uh, results in what we call cholecystitis. So uh, cholecystitis has a very unique uh, sign. The hallmark sign of, of uh, cholecystitis is pain in the right upper quadrant, which uh, which is where the gallbladder sits in the abdomen, that is referred to the right shoulder. Now, it's imp very important for you to understand the difference between uh, referred pain and radiating pain. So radiating pain originates somewhere in the body and it actively moves to a different area of the body. Referred pain means that there is uh, pain in one area of the body and pain in another area of the body, but they're not necessarily connected to each other. It's not like shooting pain that moves from one area of the body and ends up in another area of the body. Uh, but referred pain is, like I said, pain that starts somewhere uh, and there is pain elsewhere in the body. And unless you were a medical professional, wouldn't be able to put two and two together that those two um, instances of pain in different areas of the body were actually connected to each other. And so what happens is that pain that you get in the right upper quadrant with gallbladder inflammation uh, will travel back up to the brain as a pain sensation, but there's a synapse point near the right shoulder where that pain signal, pain signal can actually break off uh, into some other nerves that service the right shoulder. And so even though your shoulder is completely fine, there's no damage or there's no injury, uh, you will actually feel inaccurately or your brain will read that you have pain in the right shoulder as well. Uh, so the hallmark sign of cholecystitis is right upper abdominal quadrant pain with referred pain to the right shoulder. And I would know that uh, for testing purposes. So abdominal pain, there are two types of nerves that supply the peritoneum. I would know these two uh, bullet points that you see here. Very important for testing purposes. Uh, the parietal peritoneum is supplied by the same nerves that supply the skin of the abdomen, which help to uh, consciously perceive pain, touch, pressure, heat, cold. Uh, so it gives us a really good idea of sensation uh, inside of the abdomen. 
whereas the visceral peritoneum, which is uh, the nerves that supply um, the lining of the actual organs, are supplied by the autonomic nervous system, okay, which can produce referred pain. So the big difference between these two, because the parietal peritoneum is the lining of the actual abdominal cavity, the wall of the abdominal cavity, it's so close to the surface of the skin and supplied by the same nerves that supply the skin of the abdomen. Uh, when you have parietal type pain, it's very easy for us to consciously understand where that pain is. It's more of a pinpoint pain uh, where we can locate it very quickly. If somebody were to ask you, can you tell me where your abdominal pain is specifically? If it were parietal pain, it would be much easier for you to locate and be able to give um, uh, a more decent answer. Whereas visceral pain is um, comes from the tissue that lines the actual organs buried deep in the abdominal cavity. Uh, so visceral pain would be very difficult for you to consciously read and answer that question, where is your abdominal pain? Uh, it would be more of a diffuse pain, which is harder to tell. It's spread over a greater surface area inside of the abdomen. Uh, so if there is damage or infection or an issue with the parietal lining of the abdomen, it'd be much easier for, for you to locate or pinpoint with accuracy where that pain is. Uh, whereas the visceral peritoneum, uh, if there was an issue or injury um, with the lining of the actual organs in the abdominal quadrants, uh, would be much harder for you to locate and would be more of a dull, diffuse pain spread over maybe uh, an entire quadrant or two quadrants or the entire abdomen. So this slide, again, um, tells you about referred pain, what we talked about. So this specifically is cholecystitis. You can see the gallbladder here in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. And as that pain signal uh, travels upward towards the brain for the gallbladder to be able to tell the brain that something's wrong, uh, this synapse point that's in the neck, these, uh, as these pain signals travel upwards toward the brain, they can actually break off and move into the right shoulder. So it's pain that happens here first and in the shoulder second. Okay. But they are, this is not, uh, this is, like I said, different than radiating pain where the pain would shoot from this first spot into the second spot. Referred pain is pain that begins in the right upper quadrant, okay, with pain as well in the right shoulder, but they are separate from each other. Uh, but we know that that's a hallmark sign. If you have right upper quadrant abdominal pain and pain in the right shoulder, uh, there is a really, really good chance that you are uh, struggling from complications with cholecystitis. So as a medical provider, uh, and as you will as well when you get into the field, I hope that if somebody were to tell you that they have right upper quadrant abdominal pain, that your next question would be, do you also have pain in the right shoulder? And if they say yes, then you know from your clinical reasoning uh, and knowledge of signs and symptoms that there's a good chance that this person might be having issues with cholecystitis. So different causes of acute abdomen, um, ulcers, uh, which is erosion of the protective layer. Uh, of mucus inside of uh, the stomach or inside of a specific abdominal organ, uh, which allows that acid to eat all the way through potentially. Uh, but this takes a while, so uh, patients usually have uh, patients usually have uh, ulcers and they'll have that intermittent ab abdominal pain every once in a while. Feels like a burning pain, uh, usually in their esophagus. Kind of feels like. Um, uh, esophageal reflux sometimes, uh, but the hallmark sign of peptic ulcers, which means uh, this erosion that occurs, acid eating through the stomach, peptic means the stomach, um, uh, peptic ulcers, the hallmark sign is uh, pain that subsides after you eat, because when you eat food, it travels into uh, the stomach and it soaks up, for lack of a better way of describing it, uh, the acid that's inside of 
the stomach. So instead of eating through uh, the lining of the stomach, now that hydrochloric acid is um, breaking down the solid food product that's inside of the stomach. So that's one of the hallmark signs, pain that subsides after eating. Gallstones, uh, the gallbladder stores digestive juices and waste from the liver. Gallstones may form and block its outlet, which is the common duct, uh, which causes pain in the right upper quadrant and can lead to cholecystitis. Gallstones do not mean that there is infection uh, of the gallbladder, but it can lead to, it's a very, very common uh, predisposing factor to inflammation or infection of the gallbladder, which is cholecystitis. So, uh, right upper quadrant pain. Um, my next question, like we talked about, is do you also have pain in the right shoulder? If they say no, then it might only be at this stage where they might have a gallstone somewhere. But if there is referred pain to the right upper shoulder, right, uh, shoulder, excuse me, uh, there could be a very good chance that it is cholecystitis. Pancreatitis, itis means infection or inflammation subsequent to an infection of the pancreas caused by an obstructing gallstone, alcohol abuse, or various other diseases. Signs and symptoms for pancreatitis include pain in the upper left and right quadrants. So remember the pancreas kind of sits medial in the abdominal cavity, a little more towards the right, but when it becomes inflamed, uh, when it becomes infected, that pain is going to uh, kind of move into the uh, both the right and left upper quadrants of the abdomen. Nausea and vomiting and abdominal distension, which of course is um, expansion or swelling of the abdominal uh, cavity. Uh, sepsis or hemorrhage may occur from pancreatitis. Appendicitis, uh, the appendix, remember, is a vestigial organ, helps to store bile from the large intestine, sits in the right lower quadrant. Uh, and usually with appendicitis, of course, um, anybody with, uh, they usually complain of stabbing pain in the right lower quadrant. Anybody that complains of this stabbing pain in the right lower quadrant, any clinician's mind would first jump to uh, the presence of appendicitis, which is inflammation subsequent to an infection of the appendix. And the appendix is in the right lower quadrant. It's a hollow organ, which means if it becomes so inflamed and swells to such a degree that it actually ruptures, uh, it could uh, very easily leak that bile into the sterile peritoneum of the abdomen. Uh, so the first thing that they're going to do when you get to the ER, if you're complaining of that severe right lower uh, quadrant abdominal pain, is they might think it could be appendicitis. Or it could be a kidney stone, which is a common cause of lower quadrant abdominal pain. So one of the first things they'll do is they'll ask you about nausea, vomiting. They'll ask you about fever, chills. Uh, those are all really common signs uh, of infection. So anytime you see, as a side note, anytime you see itis, uh, you should know that the patient most likely is going to present with the nausea, vomiting, fever, chills. It's more of the run of the mill. Uh, signs and symptoms of infection. But also, if they think you have appendicitis, they're going to immediately do a CT of your um, intestines, and they're also going to do a um, ultrasound so that they can look at the appendix and see just how swollen it is or if it's ruptured. If it's swollen uh, with a chance of rupturing or it has already ruptured, uh, they're going to immediately rush you to the OR for same-day same surgery because they have to take that tissue out and clean out that area to decrease your chances of developing sepsis, which, which can, uh, that massive infection, which can kill you. Um, and if they are able to determine that it is inflamed, but it doesn't have a risk of rupturing at that point, then they're going to skip surgery and they're going to put you on uh, an immediate regimen of uh, IV antibiotics. So appendicitis, uh, more or less the hallmark sign of appendicitis is that stabbing right lower abdominal quadrant pain. Gastrointestinal hemorrhage uh, means bleeding within the GI tract. 
may be acute or chronic, or it could be upper or lower gastrointestinal bleeding. Okay. So uh, we call these GI bleeds. Um, and uh, if you are bleeding, if you have a GI bleed in the upper portion of the gastrointestinal system, more towards the stomach or the beginning of the small intestine, then that blood will enter uh, with the digestive product and the blood ha now has a chance to mix and decompose and digest along with the fecal matter inside of your uh, digestive system the entire way through the digestive system, uh, which means when you finally do uh, excrete that waste product through the rectum, it is going to look like dark tarry stools, um, uh, like wet coffee grounds. And uh, that specifically is called melina, M-E-L-E-N-A. Uh, and I would know what melina is, I would know how to describe it, and I would know what it comes from, most likely a upper GI bleed. Lower GI bleeds occur more towards the rectum or towards the output of the gastrointestinal system. Maybe it's caused by a, uh, a hemorrhoid near the rectum. But because that blood doesn't have the time uh, to mix with the fecal matter, in the, in the toilet, you'll see the patient will tell you that the blood is separated from the fecal matter. And that's one large way to tell between the difference between uh, upper and lower GI bleeds. Esophagitis. Itis means inflammation subsequent to an infection of, in this case, the esophagus. So the lining of the esophagus becomes inflamed by infection or acids from the stomach. Okay. There's pain in swallowing, heartburn, nausea, vomiting, or sores in the mouth. Esophageal varices. Uh, varices are, uh, the best way to describe them are very small um, uh, aneurysms of the capillary beds inside of the esophagus or that line the inside of uh, the esophagus. And so these little tiny capillaries, they start to balloon out due to hypertension, specifically high blood pressure in the liver, which we call portal hypertension, that backs up and it's now starting to influence, uh, influence the blood vessels that are in the esophagus. And these can balloon out to such a degree that just like any other aneurysm, they rupture. Uh, and now the patient is bleeding um, over time, large amounts of blood down into the esophagus and into uh, the stomach. Now we know that um, blood, red blood cells and their proteins and antibodies, they um, irritate the lining of the stomach, the peptic lining. And that uh, peptic lining, when it gets irritated, uh, will send a message to the brain that there's something in the stomach that we don't need that's damaging, that's harmful, and we need to get rid of it. So uh, whether it be nosebleeds, where blood is draining into the back of the throat, into the stomach, or something like esophageal varices, where there's bleeding down the esophagus into the stomach, anytime an exorbitant amount of blood gets into the stomach, uh, eventually it's going to irritate it to the point where you want to vomit. And of course, now when they do vomit, we're going to see that blood in the vomit. And we call that hematemesis. Hema in reference to blood and emesis in reference to vomiting. Uh, so hematemesis is a, um, uh, if you see it, of course, you know that that blood is coming from the stomach somewhere. Uh, and so we can kind of focus our efforts in terms of our questioning and our assessment of the patient to steer us towards the presence of something like esophageal varices or upper GI bleeds or anything that would cause bleeding into the abdomen. So some signs you might see with, with esophageal varices, fatigue, weight loss, jaundice, which is yellowing of the skin. Remember that uh, jaundice of the skin uh, means failure of the liver. And we already talked about that esophageal pharisees come from, ultimately, portal hypertension, high blood pressure in the liver. So if esophageal pharisees come from inadequacies in the liver, we can expect that inadequacies in the liver might also produce a very common uh, hepatic issue, sign and symptom, which is jaundice.
anorexia, edema, which is freestanding fluid or swelling, and abdominal pain. Mallory Weiss syndrome is very rare, but very, very dangerous, uh, where the junction between the esophagus and the stomach actually tears open. Uh, maybe not completely in the sense that the uh, esophagus and the stomach have been completely disconnected, uh, but to a degree and to varying degrees, the, that junction will start to uh, become separated which causes a massive amount of bleeding. And of course, that blood is gonna get into the stomach. And just like we talked about, uh, the, um, the stomach, when it becomes irritated, the lining of the stomach becomes irritated with blood, it's going to make you want to vomit. So uh, Mallory Weiss, extreme abdominal pain, blood in the vomit, which is hematemesis. And one of the hallmark signs and symptoms is extreme vomiting non-stop you can't stop vomiting it's uh it's um excessive excessive vomiting um i had somebody a patient with mallory weiss one time who i was suctioning his mouth and and he filled up at least three or four emesis bags that we have uh, uh throw up bags on the ambulance he filled up at least three or four of those and could not stop vomiting and he was vomiting so much that the capillaries there was so much pressure which with his retching uh, that the capillaries surrounding his eyes started to burst and he gave himself two black eyes from vomiting so frequently and so forcefully gastroenteritis itis means inflammation subsequent to an infection of the gastrointestinal system so it's uh, defined as an infection from bacterial or viral organisms or caused by non-infectious conditions, such as uh, maybe blood that gets in uh, that gets into the um, uh, that leaks into the abdominal cavity and starts to irritate the visceral lining, that uh, tissue that lines the actual organs in the abdomen. Uh, and the pr the principal symptom is uh, again this is itis, so you're going to expect the nausea, vomiting, fever, chills, weakness, all of those. Uh, common signs and symptoms for in, for infections, but also extreme diarrhea, nonstop diarrhea. Um, and again, just to remind you, uh, the three big questions that we really need to ask for patients with acute abdomen is, has there been any change in the color, the smell, or the consistency of both your bowels and your bladder? That can give gastroenterologists or ER physicians a really, really good uh, indication as to what they might suspect or what they might start testing for before they get into treatment. Uh, and so noting the presence of diarrhea in any, um, uh, in any instance of acute abdomen is very significant. Diverticulitis, like we talked about, uh, fecal matter becomes caught in the walls of the colon, causing inflammation uh, those pockets start to become inflamed and infected. So that is inflammation and infection of the diverticuli, those pockets of fecal matter that's caught in the walls of the abdomen. So again, it's an infection, so you should expect fever, malaise, which is weakness, uh, body aches and chills. And hemorrhoids, which are uh, in essence, very small uh, aneurysms, blood vessels that start to balloon out. Uh, but the, specifically, they are blood vessels surrounding the rectum. And so this is one of those causes of a lower GI bleed uh, where the blood doesn't have time to mix with the fecal matter. So you will see both fecal matter and blood inside of uh, the water when somebody is uh, having a bowel movement. Urinary system, cystitis is the medical definition for a bladder infection. Okay. Uh, the number one demographic of patients that get bladder infections uh, over all of the demographics of patients uh, would be females. And if you had to concentrate it even more than that, it would be geriatric females. Now, the reason that females get uh, bladder infections so often is because the urethra in females is much, much shorter as opposed to males. 
and also the vagina relatively is much much more exposed to the unclean external environment than the male urethra is and so the point is uh, bacteria can get into the vaginal system uh, and start to grow and proliferate uh, and if it takes hold in the urethra because it's so short it wouldn't take that much for that bacteria to spread up through the urethra into the bladder up through the ureters into the kidneys and eventually into the bloodstream uh, and it's also a good thing to know uh, you might not ever see this uh, when it comes to registry but a good fun fact for you to understand is that um, that uh, the number one cause of altered mental status in geriatric patients uh, is a, a, a bladder infection a UTI so UTIs are very, very common, and uh, especially in geriatric females. And if you have a geriatric female uh, that has altered mental status, and you've taken a blood glucose, and they're not hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic, they don't they pass the the fast test for a stroke. We don't really see any sign. We don't really see any indications to tell us definitively what's causing their uh, <clears throat> their uh, alter mental status we might ask them or somebody around them <coughs> about their bladder habits about the color consistency and smell of their of their uh, bladder movements uh, because that might give us an indication that they could have a UTI so the kidneys play a major role in maintaining homeostasis they help eliminate waste from the blood when the kidneys fail uremia results which means uh, urine that waste product uh, urine now starts to um, move into the bloodstream so now uh, urine is starting to collect in the bloodstream uh, eventually this could lead to uh, if there's urine in your bloodstream you could actually sweat it out if there's so much urine in your bloodstream uh, if you sweat it out uh, the water is going to evaporate, but all of the salt and the calcium uh, that is in that urine product, or even in your blood to begin with, is going to stay and calcify after that uh, water evaporates on your skin, off of your skin, and it looks like um, little tiny snowflakes or icicles all over your skin, and that's called uremic frost. Uh, uremic frost, uh, you can Google pictures of it, and that is urine. Uh, on somebody's skin that has evaporated uh, which is if you see that and you will most definitely smell that um, you could assume or start to question your patient down the line of if they have kidney failure or they have something wrong with their kidneys an infection or something like that acute kidney failure is sudden decrease in kidney function uh, it is reversible with prompt diagnosis and treatment Chronic kidney failure is irreversible. It's progressive, which means it gets worse and worse over time, and develops over months or years. Eventually, this keyword, dialysis, or a transplant is required. So if a patient, uh, you will have many patients that are on dialysis. Uh, and what it is is, because the kidneys can't clean your blood for you, you now have to go to a treatment center that has a dialysis machine and be dialyzed which means they hook you up to this machine and in small quantities over time it takes the blood out of your body puts it into a machine and it cleans it for you uh, if you ask me that is an incredible uh, example of the leaps and bounds that modern medicine has taken a machine can take blood out of your body and clean it and then put it back in your body uh, it's pretty incredible but it's also uh, very important for us if we do have a, a, a patient with kidney failure they will know about it uh, and if they have kidney failure uh, we can start to question them one of my first questions is do you go to dialysis if they say yes what's your dialysis schedule usually they go two or three times a week to keep their blood clean uh, and uh, if they say oh, I go every Monday Wednesday Friday uh, my next question after that is when was the last time you went to your dialysis treatment a lot of times when patients call 911 and they have kidney failure and they do go to dialysis 
there's a good chance that they've missed their most recent dialysis, dialysis treatment. And now that can cause a bunch of problems and it might be the reason they called 911. So it's definitely worth that line of questioning to go down. Female reproductive organs. Gynecologic problems are a common cause of acute abdominal pain. Lower quadrant pain may relate to the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, or the uterus. We're going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about the female reproductive organs uh, and different gynecologic emergencies in the chapter gynecologic emergencies that's coming up uh, in a few chapters. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about these different types of issues uh, when we get to that section of the book. Other organ systems, the aorta lies immediately behind the peritoneum. Weak areas can result in abdominal aortic aneurysms, or triple A's. Triple A's are very difficult to detect. Uh, use extreme caution when assessing or detecting a triple A. Uh, so triple A's, uh, they're very dangerous because it's basically saying the aorta, the largest artery in the entire body that branches off of the heart, and in essence, is responsible for carrying all oxygenated blood ejected from the left ventricle to the entirety of the body. The AAA is very large. It holds a lot of pressure and moves a lot of blood volume. So the risk of a AAA, this aneurysm, this ballooning out of the uh, aorta, the risk of it tearing and causing massive internal bleeding. If the, if, uh, the aorta were to tear open, you would be dead within seconds from hypovolemic shock, uh, from sheer uh, exsanguination. So uh, AAAs are difficult to detect until they get so large that they actually move the abdominal organs out of the way and can now start to push up through the abdomen. And the hallmark sign of a AAA uh, is <clears throat> a pulsating mass in the abdomen. So it's actually a ball, almost looks like a ball inside of their abdomen that you can see pulsating with every beat of their heart. That is the aorta. That is the aorta that you can see now on the surface of their abdomen. So when it says use extreme caution when assessing a AAA, don't palpate that pulsating mass <laughs> because you don't want to tear it open, you don't want to uh, pop, or, or you don't want it to pop, or you don't want those uh, layers of the aorta to start to separate or dissect. Uh, so if you see or suspect a AAA, use extreme caution when palpating. If you actually see one, if you can see that pulsating mass, uh, then steer very clear of palpation of that AAA. Uh, I've only seen a couple AAAs, but they are very easy to pick out, uh, and it should upgrade your transport code 3 no matter what situation you're in. Also, don't sit them forward too much because that could compress their abdomen and cause uh, the uh, AAA to dissect or tear. Uh, so use extreme, extreme, extreme caution. Pneumonia can cause ileus and abdominal pain. Hernias can occur. Uh, protrusion of an organ or tissue through an opening into a body cavity where, do, where it does not belong. Uh, it may not always produce a noticeable mass or a lump, lump, excuse me, but it is very painful. Some hernias reduce on their own, which means they will move back into place. Uh, on their own without any pressing on it or any intervention or any uh, surgical intervention. But if hernias do not move back into place, if there's too much pressure around it, it can become uh, an incarcerated hernia, also called a strangulated hernia. Um, and an incarcerated hernia means that uh, the hernia that's moved into a body cavity it's not supposed to be in now has such malregulation of blood flow that the tissue is not getting the oxygen and glucose, it's not creating ATP, and of course we all know that if that happens, the tissue will die. Uh, so if a hernia stays incarcerated or strangulated for so long, it's very dangerous because all of that tissue or that entire portion of whatever it is, a muscle or an organ, uh, will die. So hernias that do not reduce are very serious. Uh, think of it almost like uh, 
um, somebody dislocates their arm and then they never go to the doctor and they and the arm stays dislocated for hours and hours and hours very dangerous think of uh, strangulated hernias the same way so serious hernia signs and symptoms like I said a formerly reducible mass uh, that is no longer reducible okay so that means uh, like I said a hernia that doesn't go back into place very very ser serious uh, pain at the site of the hernia tenderness when the hernia is palpated or red or blue skin discoloration again red or blue skin uh, means uh, that it could be a strangulated hernia and that it could be very very serious in terms of tissue perfusion and ultimately tissue death so scene size up uh, we need to make sure that the scene is safe uh, which includes consider wearing a gown and disposable protective covers for your shoes make sure that you have uh, your gloves on of course when we're dealing with uh, very communicable highly communicable diseases and we're dealing with different types of infection and virus, viruses and bacteria uh, with these patients we want to make sure that we are protected and we want to make sure that we have our BSI excuse me BSI on MOI NOI uh, may be the result of violence you could have an abdominal injury due to excessive force uh, maybe it was a, a, an assault maybe it was uh, two people getting in a fight with each other fist fight could be baseball bat uh, penetrating trauma say gunshot wounds or stabbings anything like that uh, pale and sweating patients with tearing abdominal pain that radiates straight to the back straight to the spine uh, is very indicative uh, for the description of pain for a triple a so be aware of that characteristic odor of gastrointestinal bleeding very 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 foul smelling uh, fecal matter as the patient defecates uh, and again with upper GI bleed you would see that Molina the dark tarry stools and with uh, the lower abdominal uh, bleeding uh, lower GI bleeding you would see uh, the fecal matter and the blood separated from each other airway and breathing abdominal pain may cause shallow and adequate respirations if your abdomen is in pain the more that you move your diaphragm manipulates the tissue inside of the abdominal cavity and of course can cause you to have uh, a lot more or can uh, make that pain in the and the abdomen worse every time you breathe or every time you move your abdomen uh, so if they have shallow and adequate respirations try to coach their breathing try to get them to uh, put them in a position where they're not in as much pain uh, try to relieve it that way but ultimately if they continue to have slow or shallow respirations that's a compromise of tidal volume and we have to treat that immediately with BVM ventilations uh, circulation ask about blood and the vomit which is hematemesis or black tarry stools that's the Molina that we keep talking about for an upper GI bleed check pulses in both arms transport decision immediate transport is needed if there are signs of significant illness of course history taking uh, some things that we want to be aware of uh, when we delve into the patient's history for sample we want to know the presence of any nausea or vomiting uh, we want to um, also gauge my three favorite questions to ask GI or GU patients has there been a change in the color the consistency or the smell of the urine or the fecal matter we want to ask about any weight loss excessive belching or flatulence that could mean uh, that there is an increase in gastric motility motility being uh, the rate of speed or processing uh, of the gastrointestinal system so how fast is uh, fecal matter moving through um, moving through the gastrointestinal system or I should say digestive products moving through the gastrointestinal system so excessive blood belching or flatulence could denote some other serious conditions maybe an infection or maybe excessive hunger or some other type of uh, disease or nervous system issue uh, of course abdominal pain that acute abdomen severe abdominal pain is very noteworthy when we're talking about GI problems concurrent chest pain 
uh, other signs and symptoms that uh, the hallmark signs and symptoms that we talked about for uh, specific issues like for peptic ulcer disease or for cholecystitis. Those hallmark signs and symptoms, of course, are the ones that we're looking for to help us come to some sort of conclusion uh, as to what might be happening in their abdominal space. For the physical examination, uh, what you see in the picture is exactly what we want to do. The hands on top of each other, just like you see in the picture, and you move in a slow rolling motion, wave-like motion from the palm of your hand out to the fingertips. And we're going to do that in each of the four quadrants. So what we're looking for is that a normal abdomen is soft, non-tender. Uh, it shouldn't hurt. The patient shouldn't wince. It shouldn't be distended, that inflated abdomen we talked about. It shouldn't be rigid or hard to the touch. It should be warm. It shouldn't be cold. Uh, so the normal abdomen should be warm, soft, and non-tender. Uh, pain or tenderness upon palpation is a sign of acute abdomen uh, that there is something wrong. Okay. Um, expose and assess the abdomen and palpate gently. Remember, we don't want to push too hard. Uh, causing them too much pain could send them in, into shock. Um, of course, we don't want to make any damage that's happening inside of the abdominal system any worse. And the big one that we talked about, the AAA, the ballooning out of the aorta, we definitely don't want to palpate too hard and rupture or dissect that vessel because they could have severe internal bleeding, which could kill them within seconds. And of course, for vital signs, we want to check the respiratory rate, the pulse rate, and the blood pressure. For reassessment, frequent reassessment is important. Reassess your interventions, make sure they're still holding, make sure they're still doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and we want to reassess uh, our treatment for shock, and we want to make sure that we're providing emotional support for the patient. Transport the patient in the most comfortable position that you can. You will see a question from registry about this. I can almost guarantee it. Uh, that abdominal pain patients, they're in such severe pain, they're not going to want to lay flat and you should never force them to lay completely supine. They might want to be in a sitting position. Uh, most common, they're going to be in the fetal position, which is the knees drawn in, laying on the side with the knees drawn in towards your chest. If they want to sit that way, let them sit that way. And we can, uh, we can buckle them into the gurney and transport them that way. Uh, but I have seen many times questions from registry about how you should transport an extreme abdominal pain patient. And the, the broad answer is position of comfort. But the specific answer is uh, most likely they're going to want to lay on their side with their knees drawn in towards their chest. So make a note of that. You will see it at some point. So emergency medical care, we cannot treat the causes of acute abdomen. Anything with an itis on it is either a viral or bacterial infection, and we don't have anything to treat that in the field, but we can recognize the signs and symptoms, we can make note of the hallmark signs, and we can figure out what, uh, or have a good idea of what's going on, and we can treat the signs and symptoms, we can, uh, we can um, make the patient more comfortable, treat their ABCs, for medics we could do some, uh, some, uh, uh, narcotic uh, medications or say fentanyl uh, we could give to help ease their pain with medical controls permission um, but the case is we can't fix the problem with acute abdomen just like we can't fix the problems the underlying issue with most ailments but we can buy them time and we can uh, ease their pain or we can um, uh, get them to the hospital with some intervention uh, that is beneficial for them so Take steps to provide comfort and lessen the effects of shock. Treat for shock. Remember our treatment for shock is high flow oxygen, 15 liters a minute. Position of comfort, which we just talked about is important for acute abdomen. Rapid transport and thermoregulation help to keep them warm. Okay. After releasing the patient to the hospital staff, clean the ambulance, the equipment, and your hands. Dialysis emergencies. Remember, dialysis is the only definitive treatment for chronic kidney failure. Uh, the kidneys are not filtering the blood the, the, way, the way that they should. Uh, we have these dialysis machines that take the blood out of the body, clean it for you, and then put it back in your body. But of course, you can have some issues with dialysis. 
what happens when the machine cleans your blood of all the toxins, it also strips your blood and your plasma of electrolytes that you really, really desperately need. Uh, so some patients uh, might have, uh, might come out of the dialysis center or their dialysis treatment, uh, and they might have headache, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, uh, maybe some chest pains, and that largely is due to the depletion of uh, uh, electrolytes in the bloodstream. bloodstream. Uh, potassium is a big one, and a lot of patients end up having skeletal muscle cramping in their legs or in their arms uh, after a dialysis treatment, and that is to be expected uh, because of the depletion of electrolytes. But still, if they call 911, they want to go to the hospital, of course, we'd be more than happy to take them. Uh, if a patient misses a dialysis treatment, pulmonary edema can occur, that fluid starts building up in the, in the, uh, in the alveoli and the lungs. Some services transport patients to and from dialysis centers. The dialysis machine functions much like normal kidneys. Uh, adverse effects of dialysis, hypotension, low blood pressure, muscle cramping. Again, that's due to hypokalemia, which is low potassium levels in the blood. Nausea and vomiting, hemorrhage from the access site. Every patient that goes to dialysis, instead of getting a new IV every single time they go in, remember these patients are going three times a week, two times a week, maybe four times a week for years. They would have too much scar tissue. They would run out of access sites. So what they have is a port, which is a surgically implanted access point where they can, that they can access with a needle in the same spot every single time with guaranteed access. So it's beneficial for providers that do the dialysis treatment and for the patients that are getting dialyzed. And of course, if they have a surgically implanted device, there is a always a good risk of infection at the access site. So we can take a look at their port, we can take a look at the access site and see if there's any swelling, redness, uh, abnormal sensitivity, anything like that that would uh, denote that they have an infection. In our emergency care, of course, our priority is to manage ABCs. If the patient do, does have pulmonary edema from missing a dialysis treatment, we already talked about that we could use the CPAP if they are indicated for the CPAP. Uh, we could also use the BVM if they're contraindicated for the CPAP. So provide high flow oxygen if it's indicated. Manage bleeding from the access site if any. And for position, if they have pulmonary edema, again, uh, the patient is not going to be happy if you try to uh, uh, lay them down. When you lay them down, that fluid again s uh, spreads out over a greater surface area, and our goal is to keep it at the lowest point in the lungs as possible. So to enlist gravity's help uh, to accomplish that, the best case is to sit them upright. It's going to make it easier for them to breathe. They're not going to be as panicked, and uh, it allows the CPAP or the BVM to work the best to force that fluid out of the alveoli back into the vasculature. Uh, if the patient is in, is in shock, the supine position is the best position. And of course, transport promptly. So the next slides that are coming up are the review slides. Um, I'm not going to go through those, but uh, I would encourage you to take a look through those um, review questions. And uh, other than that, I will see you in the next chapter. Keep studying.